computer science at the University of California uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, where he holds the dual presidential chair in energy efficiency. Um, Rich has done um, led visionary large projects, uh, already several of them uh, over his career. And without further ado, I let him tell us about uh, one of them uh, right now uh, that I think is very relevant and interesting to the micro community. Uh, please post questions in the Q&A interface and um, we will sort of moderate questions at the end. Uh, Rich, please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matan. Uh, first off, uh, hello everybody in whatever time zone you're in. Uh, I know this, these are strange times and this is not normally how you attend a keynote, but I appreciate your attention uh, today and, and whether it's the morning, the evening uh, or the very late at night. I, I wanna start by thanking the micro organizing committee. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to speak to such a, a prestigious group. Uh, at my institution, we think of this as the premier architecture conference uh, and, and systems conference. And, and I'm, I'm tremendously pleased and honored to speak to you today. Um, uh, uh, as Matan uh, uh, indicated, and um, uh, and maybe uh, Demetrius and, and June intimated, um, uh, I've been working uh, lately uh, in the area of um, IoT, uh, and and I thought what I would do today is talk a little bit about uh, some of the experiences that we've had. Uh, in my group, we've been doing this for about six years now, and um, uh, and and it's led to some surprising conclusions, which I'm hoping will be uh, of some interest to this community. And I'm I'm eager to get the feedback, really, uh, from from such an auspicious group. So, uh, without further ado, um, uh, if you cast your mind back ten years uh, uh, or so, um, we were all very excited about cloud computing. This is before AI became, you know, sort of the the focus of, of public attention. We were all doing cloud computing. I was doing cloud computing commercially at the time. We spun something out of my, my uh, research group as a startup. But, but what we were hearing about from sort of the, the frontier at that time was the internet of things. And there were a lot of predictions about how this was going to be the next big thing. Um, uh, you know, you see people say there'll be 50 billion devices connected to the internet, uh, according to this by, by 2020. Um, uh, the number right now is probably somewhere around 30 billion, give or take. Uh, this says it'll be 75 billion by 2025. This one says it's going to be a trillion by 2025. And these are knowledgeable people. The, the, the sources on this are, are CEOs and, uh, and other thought leaders uh, around 10 years ago. Um, saying that this is going to be a revolution. And it's easy to see why. If you think about uh, internet search, think about the, the 90s and internet search, Google and Inc to me and, and um, uh, AltaVista and, the, and, the, and all the forerunners of, of what we do today on the internet. Uh, it, it really revolutionized the concept of human memory, right? We don't use books in the same way anymore. We do things on the internet. We don't remember things the way we used to. You know, books obviated oral history, the internet search, internet search has obviated memory. And the idea behind the internet of things is that it's really going to enhance human perception. If we can instrument everything, if we can actuate everything, and I mean everything, inanimate objects, you know, your furniture, uh, your uh, inanimate objects, your pets, your children, if we can somehow connect all of that to the internet, it's really going to change what we can perceive and control beyond what our senses can do. So that's potentially a very, very revolutionary idea, very revolutionary. And so you can see why uh, there was a great deal of eagerness for, for this to take place, but it hasn't happened. Uh, uh, and so I'd like, I'd like to now maybe start thinking about why. So, so we, we, we saw this and uh, said uh, in, in, in our, you know, from our perspective of cloud computing, said, okay, um, let's go do this. Let's go put some things on the internet. And uh, so we've done that. We've put some, some objects on the internet and, and we've learned a few things. Um, the first thing that we've learned, we think, is that in this space, power is everything. Um, one must think about the process of deployment as a software process that must be engineered. Uh, and then it's really important uh, to build for repurposing rather than purposing, which is not something that typically happens in the IoT world, but is something that absolutely happens in the data center world. Um, so let's now uh, think about what the internet really is. Um, the internet with a capital I uh, largely refers to the idea that one can look things up using HTTP, HTTPS, or some of the other internet protocols now uh, uh, through uh, a digital connection. And originally, 
uh, it was a bunch of indices stored in very, very large data centers, like this one here on the Columbia River Gorge uh, uh, between Oregon and Washington. Um, and that, but, but the data was located you know, on your desk side computer or maybe in a computer in your basement if you were working for an organization. That's changed. With cloud computing, the data itself moved to data centers. So, so the internet is really data moving between a bunch of big data centers. And then at some point, the data moves from a data center to your eyeballs. But, but really, the internet is in data centers. Now let me show you some IoT data. That is a, a, a growing area. It's a, a citrus orchard in Visalia, California. Visalia is located um, in the southeastern corner of the San Joaquin Valley, which is in the central part of California. It's right at the base of the Sierra foothills. This is looking south on a beautiful March day. And um, if you're a citrus grower, you're staring at a ton of data. This is unbelievably important data about hydrology, uh, about weather, You'll notice you'll see a rocky hillside to your left. If you, you can't really see to the right, it's flat. There's a tremendous venturi effect uh, with the wind coming out of the south when the prevailing winds are from the south. So there's wind data, and uh, uh, and and this data varies. Uh, in you know, it's time sensitive. At night, it's really different than during the day. Uh, California suffers from droughts periodically, not all the time, but periodically. So uh, there's there's a great deal of data about um, uh, you know what's happening with respect to groundwater. Uh, um, uh, you know, and and I and I want to uh, you know point out that this is not in the Columbia River Gorge. Now, one of the applications that we've been working on is frost prevention, and and this application uh, in California uh, works as follows. Uh, in the middle of the night, during the cold season, uh, there's a temperature inversion. Um, uh, uh, warm air, particularly near the hills like that, will, will rise and cold air will sink. And when the cold air gets near the roots of, uh, of your trees, it freezes them and, and your trees die. And, and these trees have about a 25 to 30 year uh, lifespan. So when you're losing an asset, you're really losing about 30 years worth of revenue um, uh, as a grower. So. So this is something that's of tremendous concern. There are two ways to remediate this problem. One is to irrigate, but in California where there's a drought, um, uh, that's incredibly expensive to do and, and, and not very eco-friendly. Uh, just, just for, well, why do you irrigate? Because it's antifreeze, because the thermal mass of the water going into the roots will actually prevent the freeze, hopefully long enough uh, for the sun to come up. The, the preferred method then, uh, because of the drought conditions, is really to use fans, large air moving uh, devices. That's, um, uh, that's this thing here. It's, this is 40 feet off the ground. Um, uh, and it's a tremendously large, uh, somewhat dangerous machine that's propane powered. And what it does is it rotates and it uh, circulates the warm air down towards the roots. And if there's about a six to eight, you know, so about a six degree temperature differential, uh, this will prevent the freeze. So um, today this is done manually. You send a team out. They circulate in trucks all night carrying uh, handheld temperature gauges. And they walk into the middle of this and turn on and off these fans. It's tremendously expensive. You spend about $50,000 a night uh, in propane. It generates huge carbon footprint. Um, so, so this is a process that they would like to optimize. Uh, and the reason this picture is drawn this way is because this photo is taken from the nearest place that there's electrical power on this property. This is about a kilometer away. So uh, if you want to automate this process, as we do, the first problem you have is there's no electricity. Um, uh, but I also want to point out as a foreshadowing for the rest of the talk, uh, the data that we're talking about is here. Uh, where the fan is, that's 30 feet off the ground or 40 feet off the ground where the warm air is. And you'd like to measure it sort of at the boundary of this, which is maybe a hundred meters, okay? Uh, if you do this the way that um, uh, we would today with the cloud, you will send data uh, somehow from this fan to the Columbia River Gorge. And you will send data from this fan to the Columbia River Gorge, which is about a thousand miles from Visalia. Uh, and then you will send the data back to someone standing here uh, uh, or sitting here in a pickup truck. Uh, and that, you know, to us always sounded a little strange, uh, both in terms of, you know, architectural efficiency from a distributed systems perspective, reliability, but also from an infrastructure perspective, because you need to be able to evacuate the data and then bring it back to almost the same location. All right. So, uh, power is everything. Um, when we went out to do this, the first thing that we discovered is we're going to spend way more money on the power infrastructure, which is solar based, than we were going to be on the systems. It's about $20,000 to run 
just a small set of PC, you know, these, these, these purpose-built PCs, industrial PCs, x86 based. Um, uh, so, so to provision about $1,000 worth of gear, I got to spend $20,000 on the power infrastructure in the form of solar panels, long distance Wi-Fi, batteries. These things have to sit on uh, concrete pads. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to do. It's fragile. Uh, unlike the power grid, these solar panels are susceptible to dust. Uh, you have, you know, sun angle changes, particularly at that latitude, there are industrial accidents. There are people driving tractors and other devices around sprayers. They run into these things. Uh, it's invasive. Um, uh, you know, your first inclination is to start running cables underneath the ground. That's really not an option. Um, uh, the solar towers interfere with farming operations. They cast shadows. You can't put them anywhere you like. Um, uh, you know, this is an industrial um, uh, concern and and uh, because you want to mitigate frost, you can't just go in and put in the, the the stuff that you need. So it's not only the power is expensive; you have to have the right kind of you know power infrastructure. And the scaling properties are terrible. The more you do of this, the more expensive, fragile, and invasive it um, uh, it must be. So um, so really, if you're going to start putting things on the internet and you're going to do it in this visionary way, where it's going to be everywhere, not just the cities where you have power infrastructure and internet infrastructure, then uh, you need to engineer for power efficiency. And, and our intuition had always been, yeah, that's because you want these things to be battery powered. And it's not that at all. You need to minimize the power infrastructure in these remote locations because you have to, independent of whether you're optimizing for battery life at all. So we found that to be pretty interesting. Okay. Now, here's, here's the thought question. What's wrong with this picture? Um, uh, you know, this device is called a flux tower. It's about $250,000 to $300,000 worth of equipment. And its job is to measure carbon sequestration. So these um, uh, uh, connections to the ground and this device over here, uh, there are pumps that are moving various fluids through, through, the, um, through the earth. And we're measuring CO2 um, uh, sequestration. Uh, here's the uh, batteries. These are uh, uh, batteries and then the solar panel. And again, and this is all um, set up to be uh, robust uh, with respect to industrial accidents. Um, uh, so, so, so what went wrong here is that this is in the wrong place. Um, this is a burn pit. This is about a hundred year old growing area. So they've been burning here for a while. You can't measure carbon sequestration in a charcoal pit. That's not what you want to do. So how did that happen? Um, uh, well, uh, even though this was designed for rocky soil, all day sun and altitude, which is where you want to measure carbon se sequestration, the process of doing this was split between uh, folks who were developing the software and folks that were deploying the system. And they didn't attend the same meetings. So, uh, uh, so that's a lovely installation. It's, a, it's exactly where someone who's in the business of installing things would like to put it, but it's not where the thing was designed for. So, so the deployment process wasn't part of the actual design. Um, uh, we, what we say is that the, develop, uh, the deployment manager, the person who was in charge of deploying this, missed the scrum, right? And they really need to be part of that process. So, so we, uh, you know, in having now done this three or four different times at scale, um, what we've figured out is you have to think about deployment at the beginning, and it has to be part of your development process. So that, you know, they have to go to the agile development meetings and discuss as stakeholders and, and developers um, what's going to happen to get this right. But there's a bunch of things went right. Um, uh, this group uh, who had put this stuff out there gave it uh, to the, the owners of that orchard, and the owners didn't know what to do with it. We're going to pay to have it removed, but asked us, could we use it? And the answer was yes, of course, absolutely. Uh, we're academics. We'll take any donated equipment, and um, and it's and it's really durable. The thing to understand about this is that it was built to do 10, 15 year kinds of experiments. Uh, so so really fabulous. Uh, but it has to be reprogrammed. The as a carbon sequestration device, it's useless. Uh, and and the typical model that we think of for IoT is rip and replace. If something breaks you replace it. And that's not going to work with something of that uh, size and caliper. So we dove in uh, you know, as motivated academics. Uh, there are three data loggers. There's almost no networking. It's completely insecure. We fixed all these things. And as soon as we did, it stopped working because there isn't enough power in the, the batteries to let, have it last overnight. So um, uh, the third thing that we learned about, uh, about IoT from this and others is that you really have to start thinking the way we used to think in the early late 60s and early 70s about general purpose computing. Things must be repurposable. 
you know, I always wondered when I teach operating systems why they kept talking about general purpose computing. If you go back and read Dijkstra's papers or whatever, they kept saying, and it's a general purpose machine, and it's a general purpose machine, which, which we think of as being, of course, it's a general purpose machine. IoT needs to go through that um, uh, uh, revolution. And if you look at a lot of IoT research, it's going the other way. We're doing special purpose things for AI and so on and so forth. But my, my, my cautionary tale here is those are fine, but at some point you're going to repurpose these things, so you better prepare for it. Okay. So power is everything, deployment is software, uh, build uh, for repurpose instead of purpose. And the conclusion that falls out of this, which surprised us. So I'm, what I'm about to say is going to be controversial. Uh, it's not intended to be controversial. It's just the thing that seemed to, to jump out after going through this exercise many times and failing many, many, many times is that the internet at present is engineered backwards for what's required to achieve this new vision. Think about the cloud today. Here's, here's my argument. Think about the cloud today. The cloud um, is really designed to deliver a great deal of content to a large number of consumers and to take back, not shown in this picture, a very, very small amount of data. The killer applications to the cloud are e-commerce and entertainment. And they all, uh, all of the applications in that space have the following properties. You serve endless, almost limitless amounts of data, streaming data, non-streaming data, visual, whatever, from the cloud to the consumers. And then the consumers click. And the clicks carry tremendous amounts of information in a very, very small package. The clicks themselves, while they're very small, are very meaningful. And the order in which they occur is meaningful and the timing between them is meaningful. That's how recommendation engines work. You serve a bunch of stuff, and then you observe the reaction. The reaction is very short and very small. So very little data comes back, but the data that comes back is incredibly important. So you need to really save it, right? That data you're not gonna get again. It comes once, it's time sensitive. You have to really safeguard it here in the cloud. And in order to be able to make inferences about individuals, you need a ton of this data because what you're gonna do is take the planet's population and categorize it into clusters. And the clusters have to be big enough to make meaningful statistical inferences. That's what AI does. We call it AI today, it used to be called machine learning, before that it was called statistics. But the bottom line is there's this giant regression that takes place. We do a huge amount of clustering. The data is incredibly valuable and it's very, very big. And the cloud is engineered for this entire orchestration. Right? That's what this says. We're making an inference or a prediction about a specific individual, and we need all of that mechanism and that architecture to accomplish that goal. And it's a miracle. When I go to Amazon, it knows what I want to buy next. It just does because it's watching everybody do this. I'm, I'm constantly amazed by how well that works. IoT is going or is different. Here, you have trillions of devices, and they're sending data to the cloud, and nothing comes back, right? Maybe an actuation signal comes back, but data is raining in, not out of the cloud. So the data is reversed. Furthermore, the data itself is not big. You're not trying to cluster IoT devices together to figure out what their preferences are in an e-commerce setting. You're trying to make inferences often about geographic locations, just as I was intimating with that application. So you don't have big data, you have lots and lots of little data. The collections of little data data sets is big, but it's not this giant big data um, uh, uh, thing. The other thing is it's always on. Think about Amazon's worst day, worst day. Here's Amazon's worst day. Everybody on earth simultaneously tries to buy something. That's what, 4 billion clicks? And those 4 billion clicks are really important because they're transactions. So we gotta be able to do 4 billion simultaneous transactions and not lose any of them uh, from the planet. That would give Amazon engineers heartburn. This is a trillion. And they're clicking every 200 milliseconds, every minute, we're not prepared. And then the systems that we have today are not engineered for this architecture. So as an academic, this is very exciting, right? Because it means we're pouring, we have made this huge investment in a globally distributed infrastructure that isn't gonna be able to achieve what we wanna achieve. We have to think about this, it's lovely. 
So a couple of uh, things that I'd like to just say as my own, this is my own uh, anime versions or, or Picadillo, depending on how you want to think of it. Uh, I have this conjecture, which says that for IoT, really, the actionable relevance for IoT data decays like the square of the distance from where it's gathered. That doesn't mean that from Alexa or these other kinds of uh, surveillance devices, you don't get a lot of that preference data, you do. But if we're really trying to instrument the planet, uh, um, uh, uh, this is something that seems to be, or something along the lines of, uh, uh, of being true, which is the, the data is really, really useful, particularly in real time, where you gather it. It may be useful for other purposes far away, but, but you have to think about how to use it in the place that you're gathering it. And then the, uh, the motto that we use in my group, uh, much to the chagrin of my graduate students who all love the cloud dearly, um, uh, is the more the data moves, the more expensive, power using, and failure prone the system is. As you move that data from one place to another, as you get it across radio links or, or through battery powered devices, the, the, the possibility for something going wrong goes up. Okay, so why is this hard? Why, why are, are a bunch of academics in my group you know, struggling with this and, and when, when, um, and when we're all happily off doing other things uh, that, that seem easier? Um, so, so here's a real world example. Uh, I went to one of my students who was very interested in a particular device, uh, uh, which has some great power properties and some great storage properties that we wanted to use in this frost prevention thing. And I said, okay, good. Let's first use the existing commercial cloud IoT uh, mechanisms to, to, to run this application. So we have to see, you know, where we need, the, where are the gaps? What's missing? Okay. And I said, student, uh, who's a really good embedded systems programmer, go hook your device up to Amazon's um, IoT infrastructure. And we've done this with Azure. I'm gonna pick on Amazon because I have this lovely diagram from Marcus Mock, a uh, colleague in Germany. Um, uh, but, but this is absolutely true, if not truer, for the other public cloud infrastructure. So, so there's no prejudice here. It's just that they produce these lovely pictures. Okay, so student says, all right. So I said, I would like Hello World to go from your fabulous little device to a database in Amazon, DynamoDB, which is this big distributed database. Let's just do that. And a student says, okay. So first thing the student had to do was make uh, an environment work on, uh, on that device using uh, Amazon's IoT SDK. Um, so that's a bunch of C++ programming uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a little bit of Python and, and some stuff with USB and, and, uh, and, and Flash programming. And he's pretty good at that. Uh, but then he had to get MQTT working. This is a communications protocol. It's designed for the internet, but uh, this device, you know, which has a Zigbee radio can run MQTT, but that involves a TCP stack that has to work over Zigbee. So there's a bunch of, of development and programming debugging that goes there. That interfaces to a system called AWS IoT Core. This is largely written in Python. It's part of the AWS uh, suite. Um, uh, it lives in Amazon, has its own set of very, very rich APIs. To make that work uh, required uh, a whole bunch of TLS hacking. Uh, the transport layer security protocol that Amazon uses is slightly broken with respect to certificate uh, timeouts. Um, uh, it took about four weeks and a bunch of uh, back and forth with Amazon to get just this piece working. Um, once that was working, the student had to figure out how to use S3 because we were gonna use AWS Lambda as a reactive event-driven system. Um, uh, and, and Lambda takes things from S3, and then Lambda was going to push things to DynamoDB. Now, like many of you, I have the distinct privilege of working with some of the most clever, dedicated, hardworking, focused people on earth in this space, graduate students. They are so eager to get away from me and go work for Google, Facebook, or Amazon that they will do almost anything 24 7. But, but if you're a, a manager, how many people do you know who are experts in seven different technologies just to get Hello World to work? Forget about what happens when we make a bunch of production quality applications out of this. This student's just trying to write a paper, right? I mean, the, the breadth of expertise, the, 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 uh, the set of technologies that one has to become facile with just to get this to work was staggering. Start to finish this was a six week exercise. Right, that that's just impossibly bad, and and my prediction is this is a placeholder. There's no way IoT is going anywhere if it's this hard. So there's a lot of room for work, but this is the state of play today. Okay, 
So we started looking at this and we said, well, all right. Um, uh, uh, so it's not that, it's not um, uh, this thing, but what is it? Well, we've noticed that cloud computing has been unbelievably effective. I've done large scale distributed high performance computing for a long time and we've never had anything work as well as the cloud works. And so the question is why? Uh, and, and one of the, the observations about if you work in cloud is everything is a service, remember? Software is a service, platform is a service, this is a service, that is a service, it's all a service. And, and the reason is, there's some really good reasons for that. Services react. They sit there, they're passive and they, they're reactive and that's really efficient. You're not burning any time uh, when the service isn't needed. Uh, the, the event is coming from the user that you want to do and, and you know what you want to do. Uh, it's a very sort of synchronous RPC-like uh, mechanism, generally speaking. So, so that's good. We know how to, uh, how to use that. We know how to engineer for that. Uh, they hide infrastructure detail. APIs are very, very abstract. And, and we can change around what happens on the fly. You know, I was shocked to learn when I started talking to my friends at Amazon way back when that they, there are people driving around with beepers. And when something goes wrong originally, I don't think this is true anymore, but originally they would just go in and patch it on the fly. It's dynamically re re reprogrammable behind the scenes, but the API is constant. So you have this ability to do reprogrammability very, very dynamically behind the, the API abstractions. They are reprogrammable. We, there's all this, you know, AB rollout, roll in um, uh, kinds of mechanisms. They're all automated, right? You can, you can automate. Uh, and in fact, uh, companies like Netflix have, have elaborate infrastructures for automating the updates to existing services behind the existing APIs. Uh, and as we said, they're abstract. And, and what this does is it allows you to manage heterogeneity. You don't know what hardware this thing is running on, nor do you care. You don't know what the storage devices are. You don't know when they upgrade the networks. It's, it's a very, very abstract um, a concept. So when you have this vast heterogeneity in data centers, you get this portability uh, uh, of your abstractions. So if that's true and we wanna scale IoT, devices themselves should run services, no, right? This is the secret of the cloud. Let's just figure out how to run services on devices and we're done. Um, they'll be power efficient because they're reactionary. Uh, you can do programmable deployment, remember, where you can do roll in, roll out behind the API system keeps working. They're repurposable. Uh, you know, we can change the functionality, add APIs or change the semantics of the APIs. And, it, and, and if you think data centers are portable, there's really two architectures in a data center today, x86 and, and increasingly ARM. <laughs> there are a lot of IoT architectures in the microcontroller world and they're not compatible. They, they're not even von Neumann architecture sometimes. So uh, really the heterogeneity in the IoT space is vast vastly dwarfing the heterogeneity in data centers. And so we have to be able to turn, you know, to uh, attain that. Okay, so if this is true, then we're gonna have to flip the internet and we're gonna put the services on the devices or services at the edge, then what's the cloud for? Ah, the cloud is to run the applications. Clouds are really good, as we said, at serving graphical interfaces to users. So users should really be running their interfaces in the cloud and the services should be really running on the devices. And if you look at this model, this model has the devices as clients of services running in the cloud. So it's backwards. Okay, so what do we need to do to do devices as services? Well, we need a, an environment. We need a service hosting environment, but it has to be multi-scale. And, and what that means is that you gotta be able to run a service on a device that has 80K bytes worth of data and run the same service in Amazon without modification or anywhere in between on the device, in the edge, on the edge, or in the cloud, unmodified. So that means it's multi-scale, but it's not multi-scale in terms of the number of resources, it's multi-scale in terms of the scale of the resource. Really capacity should be the only mitigating factor. And so our approach was to try and figure out how to build such a multi-scale service hosting environment. And we took our cue from clouds. Uh, the way that very, very efficient um, cloud services are built today is using something called functions as a service. If you haven't seen this, um, uh, then uh, you know this will be helpful. If you have, please please bear with me. Functions as a service is is sort of an old idea that's become new. Uh, in the cloud, one writes functions as a service web services by essentially programming stateless callbacks. These are small uh, threads of execution. 
Um, uh, they can't execute forever. I think there's a five minute cap in most uh, infrastructures for this. And they're written in a high level language. You package these functions with the libraries and dependencies um, uh, that you want uh, them to, to take advantage of, particularly if you're writing in Python or Node.js, uh, something like that, which really is library dependent, um, uh, and you upload it to the platform. So it's really a form of platform as a service if you're, if you're from that um, era uh, in cloud computing. And then it's executed in a container of some sort. This is an isolation container. Often it's a Linux container uh, so that you can get very, very high densities. Um, uh, it's an event uh, driven programming model, which means that these functions, these stateless functions are essentially triggered for events that you also register uh, with the venue. Um, and, and there's no storage or communication model in functions as a service. So anything that you wanna do outside of that stateless function has to exit your FAS platform, either through a database or through a, sort of an external load balancer or, or URL gateway. Okay, so that's a great model. It's an event-driven programming model and it's very cloud-driven. Um, uh, uh, so we said, well, let's just do that, but let's make it multi-scale. And so we came up with CSpot. Uh, CSpot stands for Serverless Platform of Things. And the first version of the infrastructure, but not the programs that you run in it, is written in C. Um, uh, when, I, when I give a CSpot talk, people go, yeah, but nobody programs in C. And you don't have to. In order to use CSpot, you can program in Python. Uh, but the infrastructure itself is written in C so that it'll run on devices easily. Uh, it runs on microcontrollers, small Linux, uh, campus clouds, public clouds uh, of any, uh, any sort. Um, it is source code portable today. We're working on uh, package portability right now. Um, uh, but importantly, uh, it includes append-only storage, so you don't exit CSpot in order to store something, uh, and that storage is distributed. It's append-only, and there's a way to distribute it, uh, so there's eventual consistency, uh, uh, an eventual consistency model. Um, and it uses a log-based runtime, and this is really important because if you're in the IoT world and the billions of these functions are firing, and they're asynchronous, this is a very asynchronous programming model, it's event-driven programming, and something goes wrong, root cause analysis is really hard. So what we did is we made the CSpot runtime a log so that you can do root cause analysis. You can actually track back the causal dependencies when something goes wrong. This has proved incredibly helpful uh, uh, in these environments. So, um, but the takeaway, if you're not interested in the details is it's a multi-scale framework that's functions as a service for building network facing services, microservices in the Linux cloud serverless and what we call nano services tiny, tiny, tiny little services that will run in very resource restricted devices in a very power efficient way. It's open source, by all means, uh, join us. We, we, we're very excited uh, for the community to, to help us figure out all the things we've done wrong. We're about to come out with release 2.0 that's got a much better build model and some deployment support, but, but uh, it's ongoing. We use this uh, in our applications. This is what our uh, uh, IoT looks like at UCSB. We put uh, CSpot on pretty much everything. Drones, uh, moisture sensors, tractors, you name it. If it's out there and it's got a microcontroller or a small, uh, small board computer, we'll put CSpot on it. Uh, we run it at the edge. Uh, we put in edge clouds. Um, uh, these are small collections, small clusters, usually under $1,000 of machines that run uh, an emulation of AWS called Eucalyptus. Um, uh, and we put that usually in an outbuilding, uh, a pump house or, or um, maybe a farm office. Uh, and, and the IoT, this is usually a hybrid network of some sort. Um, uh, IoT applications communicate with uh, services running in CSpot on the edge. When we run out of capacity at the edge, we move the data up to a regional uh, cloud, which is at UCSB. We run a fairly moderate, uh, moderately good sized uh, eucalyptus cloud. UCSB that was generally uh, genuinely funded by the National Science Foundation as part of the Aristotle project. And then if we run out of capacity at UCSB or we're in some, involved in some large scale sharing exercise, we put these things in the public cloud. Uh, and it doesn't matter what public cloud because CSpot will run in all of them. Uh, but the key thing is, is it's one infrastructure. The code that, to do all of this is portable up and down this hierarchy without modification. Okay, um, and it's really efficient. Um, uh, this is a benchmark, uh, and uh, it's just a, a function dispatch. Now, um, there are some caveats here, and this is, this is sort of why, uh, this is a kind of cautionary tale if you decide you want to pursue some of this research. Um, uh, so we, we start out to, to figure out, you know, is this more efficient? And, and we just 
launched a, a, a function handler and we wanted to see how much faster it is. And if you launch a null function handler um, uh, uh, in CSpot or you launch a function handler that queries the clock, uh, which is what this function handler does, here are the numbers you get. It's about 38 milliseconds on an ESP8266. Um, uh, this is a common Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller. It's a little power hungry. Um, uh, but it's, it's something that occurs in lots of different um, uh, applications. About 38 uh, milliseconds. On a Raspberry Pi, you get 37 milliseconds. This is with a container. So uh, this is showing you that containers actually give you a little bit of, uh, of overhead. This should be much faster because the Pi is a stronger, a, a faster clocked uh, CPU with, with better memory than uh, the controller. This is an Intel NUC. This is a pretty fast device. It's for gaming. It's a small uh, project computer, but it's got about 3.3 gigahertz clock. And, and you're getting a four millisecond um, uh, dispatch time. Inside our, our cloud at UCSB, it's five. If you run CSpot in EC2 in a decent instance, it's five. Uh, if you convert your CSpot handler to Python, it's 18. So you get a factor of three in just the language conversion. These are all written in C. But if you run AWS Lambda, it's 253. Okay, this is two orders of magnitude difference. And, and what I was saying a moment ago, if you run a null function handler in AWS Lambda, it's five. So they're shortcutting the null, but as soon as you do anything, this is your dispatch time. And, uh, and, and this doesn't say that my graduate students are better than an army of professional engineers working on this at Amazon. What it says is that there's a great deal of optimization potential in this model, a great deal. This is because we're not bound by the tyranny of the web service. We're not designing devices to be uh, clients of the cloud. We're, devi we're designing devices to implement IoT irrespective of the cloud. And that may not make sense from a financial perspective, but it sure as heck makes sense from a performance perspective. I mean, think about all the papers you've written in your time where you've gotten a 20% performance improvement. Imagine you know, if that was two orders of magnitude, it's shocking. Okay, that was AWS. Here's uh, Azure, just to, to show you. This is, um, uh, uh, this is the exercise, CC320SF. This is a new controller that, uh, for which the, um, the various um, IoT SDKs had not really been tested. Uh, it's a nice one. It's got 80 megahertz clock. It's got quite a bit of memory. It's got hardware cryptography, so you can do uh, the TLS stuff very, very efficient. Turns out we can even do better than this by, by a lot. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, this is the Intel NUC I was telling you about. Um, uh, and we ran uh, NUC at the edge, and we did this on campus rather than, because um, this is a new thing, we haven't deployed it in the field just yet. Uh, and this is the device moving to uh, the edge using CSpot, 119 milliseconds on this controller, you know, with this controller. This is Azure IoT Edge. So they have an edge infrastructure in Amazon, which is designed to run on these edge devices as opposed to the cloud as a way station, uh, uh, order of magnitude. This is CSpot talking to an instance in Azure, and again, an order of magnitude. Uh, this is time, and this is energy. Uh, and you can just see that uh, you know, you're in about the same order of magnitude with respect to time and energy. Executing faster means you're using less energy, and this is code size. Um, uh, so, so again, Compared to the commercial solutions, and and uh, you know these solutions are have tremendous investments in them. Uh, this approach offers a great deal of promise. We think. Okay, I'll, I'll begin to sort of conclude here and uh, uh, and take your questions at, at the end if you have any. Um, you know, a keynote wouldn't be a keynote without some sort of uh, prognostication, uh, which is which is worth all the prognostication you remember from the previous keynotes, and this will be no different. But uh, here here are my thoughts. Taming heterogeneity um, will really require one ring to rule them all. It's not going to be CSpot. I promise you it won't be CSpot. Hopefully it's something inspired by CSpot. Hopefully that, that this is research that, that has the next generation of infrastructure developers thinking uh, differently. But, but today, CSpot is source code uh, uh, programmatically deployable. You can, you know, you can take a CSpot disk, or if you've got access to GitHub, push a button and it deploys. Uh, but it's doing a build, which is not very power efficient and takes a long time on some of these devices, a tremendously long time. So we're working on really employing the deployment infrastructure for CSpot to make this better and power efficient. But uh, once it's running, it's power efficient. Deployment is not power efficient. But that, that also says, you know, again, deployment is part of the software process. So we're practicing what we preach. Um, but I think there will have to be some environment 
like the cloud that everything uses because there's just way too many of these devices and they're way too different from each other. There's a huge open hole in this, which has to do with secure registration and discovery. Once you get these devices talking to each other and you commission them, that you, you, you exchange secrets so they can you know, co-authenticate, it's all great. But that process right now is hard and it's manual uh, and time consuming. And so, uh, so we're thinking maybe blockchain or something along those lines uh, as a way of building a, a, a registration discovery infrastructure. We're not sure. It's a great area to be thinking about, particularly with respect to heterogeneity and power efficiency. Um, it, you know, high level uh, platform programming extractions are a real aid. Uh, um, uh, once you get this thing going and you're writing functions as a service, it's great. You know, getting the infrastructure in place is not great, but, um, uh, but it's really, really useful. However, CSpot is really an assembly language. This is like the old days when we did the internet with Apache web servers and HTTP. Remember, if you, if you don't remember, you know, you'd stand up your own Apache web server and you'd put in your own HTTP, you know, text things and other people, you know, Google would index it and other people would access it. So you're doing things at the very beginning really by hand. And today you don't. Today there's all these wonderful IDEs and, and, uh, and, and high level infrastructure uh, abstractions for essentially generating, you know, that low level um, uh, mechanism. Uh, C-spot is this low level mechanism. There's nothing high level about it. Um, uh, uh, and it really needs that, or something else that takes its place as this assembly language really needs that. It's not the answer, it's just the beginning of the question. Um, uh, from a, a, you know, an IoT, AI, and future uh, cloud um, perspective, here's a prediction that, um, that I wanna make, which is high performance computing is really going to matter. You know, if you, I, I have a lot of, uh, you know, amazing colleagues in this HPC space, you know, who worked on the grid and before that parallel computing. And, uh, and, and, and when we sit together and drink coffee uh, now on Zoom, um, you know, they're a little downcast because, uh, because HPC is cool, but AI is cooler. And, uh, and all this cloud business is really about recommendation engines and, and, and not about physical simulations. But for IoT, really, physical models matter. Often what you're doing in an IoT context is modeling something about the environment in which the device is located and then fusing that with something that AI can tell you. Like if you're talking about a smartly connected home, there's gonna be an awful lot of modeling of the home, finite element analysis, computational fluid dynamics, all the classic HPC hits. And then there's gonna be some AI component, Alexa or something like that. And you wanna put those two things together to make a model for what the inhabitant of the home is doing or needs to do or, or desires. And so my prediction is the future of AI for IoT will be a fusion of the AI technologies that have everybody you know, really, really excited and, and the physical models uh, that HPC represents you know, in, in one uh, or, or coupled uh, in, in environment. And, and we're seeing this today. We are deploying computational fluid dynamics for the frost prevention application and hooking that up to you know, our telemetry and, and AI models to try to see if we can prove this out a little bit. Uh, the cloud architecture will be tiered. Um, if, uh, you, know, you, you may not realize this, but Netflix um, serves no or almost no video from the cloud. Netflix is famously all cloud. They got rid of their data centers early. When they got rid of their CD business, they got rid of their data centers and they run everything from the cloud. But the only thing that runs in the cloud itself, an actual cloud data center, is the recommendation engine and the credit card database. CDNs, content distribution networks located at the edge, operated by Akamai or Level 3 or some of these other CDN, serve all the videos. So the, the data is actually coming from a very, very distributed edge network. It's still moving out, but it's there. My prediction is there'll be something called a service distribution network. They will push cloud services to the edge. Just like they've pushed CDNs to the edge, that's the only way IoT is gonna work. So, uh, uh, so service distribution networks, and you're starting to see this. Amazon announced this thing called Outposts. This is very funny. We, we, we talked to Amazon 10 years ago, and, and I talked to a very, very high level, I didn't talk to, to uh, Jeff Bezos, but I talked to someone who works for Jeff Bezos. And I said, you guys are gonna need an edge version of Amazon. And they said, that will never happen. That will never happen. This person said that will never happen and they released the product last year. So, uh, so they're, even their thinking has, has come around. Um, energy uh, efficiency meets computer science. That's the big takeaway uh, for us 
at least initially. And, and, and we're now part of the Energy Efficiency Institute uh, at UCSB. This is a, a, a multidisciplinary research um, organization at UCSB consisting of computer scientists and lots of people who are not computer scientists um, uh, thinking about how we do energy efficient data centers, how we do energy efficient communication, long distance, short distance, outdoors, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's really exciting to be working in such a multidisciplinary context. Um, I'll leave you with, um, uh, you know, uh, a final observation. Um, you know, my students, like your students, um, complain about uh, the recruiting process um, when they go to work for some of these large tech companies. Uh, you know, they have to take an exam. They go to work for a tech company and, and the exam is typically, you know, code binary search, uh, you know, on this blank uh, document and make no mistakes or um, write a hash tree or, or, or you know, uh, some thought question. Uh, and, and, and these you know, exams get reviewed by the interviewers and you can fail them. And so there's this whole cottage industry, which they all take part in for learning you know, what exam questions that are likely to be asked and just practicing memorizing the, the coding solution. This seems a little silly, uh, but it's the way it's done. In the future, it isn't gonna be the exam. It's gonna be, what do you know about irrigation? Can you fly a drone? How hot is the, physically hottest device you've ever uh, programmed. Uh, these two people, graduate students up here in the upper right-hand corner are standing in a pump house in Fresno. The interior temperature in this tin building is 140 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer. And we've, this is a pump over here on the left. We've got equipment uh, uh, that's, that's cited here. Um, you have to really think differently uh, to program in that environment. And I think this is going to be the new resume. You're going to want to show up with pictures um, uh, and, and the equipment that you use rather than whether you can code binary search tree. Um, uh, so, so if you're a grad student uh, and you're thinking about your future in this space, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot more of a contact sport. Um, my grad students thought they would spend their entire graduate student career in a cubicle in my lab, and they haven't. Um, I'm gonna end there and, uh, and, and leave a little time for questions and maybe time to go uh, take a little break before the, the first session and say, thank you to our sponsors and our collaborators. This is absolutely a contact sport. You can't do this without experts who are not computer scientists uh, and domain experts from other areas. Um, uh, uh, you know, they've been very, very generous with their time. Uh, it's fun to work with them. Um, uh, it's great to, 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 to really see the impact firsthand that research has. Um, uh, we've had a lot of generous support from funding agencies. This is joint work with Dr. Chandra Krintz and myself at UCSB, the Energy Institute. Uh, you know, please get to know these faces. These people are going to be ruling the world soon. They are my graduate students. They're unbelievable. They, they, they shock me every day with how good they are. Uh, I will stop there, say thank you very much for your attention uh, and for the opportunity to speak to you today and take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much, Bridge, um, for this, uh, what I think at least is an inspiring talk. I have lots of questions, but in the spirit of uh, getting more interactions and showing uh, that there, this questioner approach to things, uh, we have um, you know, some from the audience who will get to participate and, and ask some questions uh, this time. Um, I know that uh, one signed up ahead of time, so maybe we'll start with Hanwei. Hanwei uh, Wang, you start. You registered ahead, so we'll give you first first dibs on, on questions for Rich. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, uh, my question is: uh, What's your vision on running like machine learning models on the edge, like a tiny ML? Do you think that's yep. the future for the IoT devices? Thank you. Yes. Yes, I do. I think tiny ML and these power efficient um, uh, ML kinds of things at the edge play a very, very important role. Um, and I actually think, contrary to uh, what many people think, you can do training at the edge. So, uh, so there's training and inference. And for a while, uh, uh, many of us, uh, including yourself, I'm sure, have felt like inference at the edge is, is completely possible, particularly with special purpose hardware. But we've actually experimented with doing training at the edge with and without special purpose hardware. And, uh, and, and I think it's a rich area. I think that, that you know, if you start thinking about power efficiency, if you start thinking about time to you know, um, solution, and if really start thinking about carbon footprint, like, like one of the things that, that we're starting to think about with a colleague at Chicago, Andrew Chin, is 
okay, how do we minimize carbon footprint? And sometimes to minimize carbon footprint, what you want to do is you want to go slower. So you, you do your stuff at the edge and it takes maybe twice as long, but because it's solar powered, it's carbon footprint is zero. So, uh, so there's all these things. And if your duty cycle is long enough and you're making your duty cycle, you need a measurement every 10 minutes or something like that, you, you have a lot of space. So, so uh, tiny ML, these kinds of things are really important. What I, will, what, what I will say though, is that it's really important to think about how to repurpose that. You know, it, what, what often happens in these things is you get that model working and you get it working great. And, and, and then you put it at the edge and then something changes. There's a camera upgrade or they wanna change the application you know, or, or there, there, uh, there's some change in the application. And that whole reprogramming process can be expensive and error prone. And, and so, so, so what I would encourage the tiny ML community to do is think about reprogrammability in, in these edge models, but for sure, makes a big difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, how about Wen-Wen uh, uh, Wang, second in line? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I'm Wang from the University of Georgia. Thanks for your wonderful talk. So given the potential in driving set uh, diversity of microcontrollers, for example, different generations of ARM, PC, and many others, uh, how does CS uh, board handle such a diversity issue while migrating container-based services across microcontrollers with different uh, interaction sets? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a great question. So, so the, I think the question that you're breaking up a little bit is, is how do you manage heterogeneity across this the zoo of microcontrollers? Uh, um, uh, and and for those of you who, who haven't seen this, not all of them have von Neumann yeah. models. Like some of them, you can't reprogram over the radio, or you've got memory for program code, and then separate memory for or storage for for data. I mean, it's it's a problem. So 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 far, we've been doing this with. Um, uh, source code compatibility. The C spot, C spot itself is not one piece of code, right? It runs one piece of code. You can run at your same code, but itself is it's made up of these different things. And so what we do is we have a microcontroller infrastructure, which is very simple. Uh, uh, it has its own built-in tasking system, little operating system. It has its own built-in append-only storage thing, which is very simple. We've deliberately designed it so it can be compiled from source for just about any microcontroller. Still a porting effort. Um, uh, but uh, so that's not very satisfactory. That's how we do it today. The, the, the thing we're looking at today is cross compilation. What we really want is a service. Uh, it's gonna be an edge-based service, but, um, uh, but, but what you really wanna do is, is have a cross compiling environment, maybe container-based. So you can pull a repo down with a cross compiler that runs at the edge that can package up and compile for whatever microcontrollers are sitting next to your edge and, and hopefully program them over the radio. That's one thing. The other thing that we've been experimenting with, frankly, uh, you know, are high level languages and interpretation. Because while you can't program over the radio with binaries, often you can run an interpreter and then send bytecode of some kind. It's, you don't wanna send Java, please. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but we've been experimenting with that idea as well as a way to get reprogrammability. So far that hasn't been very power efficient. So, so I'm not recommending that. But, uh, but, but, but we think, we're hoping, that we can build sort of an edge-based cloud infrastructure, you know, an edge cloud infrastructure for cross compilation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for attending. All right. Um, looking at the people I can see on the list, uh, uh, Joseph, Charles, do you want to go next? Okay. Um, I will read out the question since I'm not hearing, uh, not hearing Joseph speaking in the interest of time. Uh, the question is also in the Q&A. Um, Rich, can you summarize uh, two things? Why uh, has IoT not yet taken over as expected? And two, what needs to happen for this to, to occur? Right, so, um, so it is my view. Uh, first, it's just too hard, right? When you make these devices clients of the cloud, uh, the number of technologies that you need to get working in concert together is staggering. Uh, the hello world example uh, from the talk was seven. You had to get seven different technologies, which were all designed separately. These, these were not designed to work together. They were designed for different purposes, DynamoDB and AWS Lambda and IoT Core you know, and MQTT. These are all completely separate. Suddenly they have to work 
in concert in a very efficient way with very, very little lost resource. And, and, and so that's one problem. Second problem is when devices, you know, the internet is designed for eyeballs. The, the device that is, you know, interfacing to these services are, are your eyeballs typically, maybe through your phone, but, um, you know, and so all the protocols are designed to be very, very resource rich. Um, uh, like TLS is a nightmare for battery power. Um, uh, but it's really what web services use. And because we have this investment, we're trying to force those internet protocols into the device. That just doesn't work. Uh, you run out of battery, right? We spend all this time trying to figure out how to put enough batteries and solar panels out there so that we can run TLS. That's just, that's just a recipe for failure. So um, now what needs to be done? A, I think we need to reverse our thinking. I think we need to start thinking about pushing the services towards the edge into the device if possible. The thought experiment that C-Spot um, uh, conducts is what happens if we actually want to run web services? Things that respond to web service requests in 80 you know, kilobytes of uh, memory you know, in a microcontroller. That's what C-Spot does. You can run a web service um, uh, you know, in a tiny, tiny little device. I'm not sure that's what you want to do for everything, but, but it's an example of, of testing the extreme of what we can do. And I think that's going to be what's necessary. Things are going to move to the edge. They're going to get scaled down and scaled up. It's much easier to scale something from the device level up to the cloud than it is to crush something from the cloud level down to the device. So I think we're going to change our thinking uh, about the devices. We're going to stop thinking of devices as clients. We're going to start de designing for scale up from the device level uh, for a new kind of um, platform or infrastructure specifically for IoT. That's what I think needs to happen. And thanks for attending, Joseph. I, pre I appreciate it. All right. Well, um, we do have one or two more questions, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we don't have this informal part <laughs> later today where you could just uh, walk up uh, to to Rich and, and ask him questions. But um, I will get from the Q&A if I cannot access it and send it to him later, maybe By all means. Opportunity yes. for, uh, for some discussion. Uh, it's too bad, you know, unfortunately we're not all in, in beautiful Athens and, and going to enjoy the corridor discussions, but- um, Yeah, I'm very disappointed not to be visiting Athens. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that, that soon we will all have this opportunity. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, so Rich, thank you thank all you very, very much. For thank the you. great talk. And um, we will move on immediately to our, our sessions now. Uh, we're all remote, so you can all take your breaks when you absolutely need